Genzibar Jam is coming May 29th through June 1st. Learn, share, and connect with us in Dallas, Texas at the Gaylord Texan Resort. It's time to jam at Genzibar's annual meeting. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. This is Dr. Joe Salustio back with you here on another episode. And uh, I've told you in the past, but we'll never stop doing this. And uh, of course, shout out to the co-founder of this podcast, Elvin Freitas, who ensures that will be true because he has me booked out every single day for at least three months at a time. As we talk to some, if not all, sometimes I think it's all of the innovative higher ed leaders uh, across the world. Uh, the insights that we're able to gain and pass on to all of you listeners are absolutely incredible. And we try to give you varying perspectives, right? This is what this is all about, is bringing as many diverse voices to the microphone as humanly possible to talk about how we serve students. We're in an interesting time. I always talk about this in, uh, in higher ed. As of today, as we're recording this, we're in the middle of the FAFSA uh you could put whatever word on uh, behind that that you'd like to FAFSA craziness FAFSA FAFSA simplification uh, whether it's good bad or indifferent there are many 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 students that are and families that are having trouble getting information right now um, it's depro dis uh, boy let me try that again disproportionately disproportionately affecting students that are first gen from lower economic backgrounds who don't know how to ha navigate these processes. And that's an important part for us to do as administrators is to make sure that we are trying um, to help these high schools uh, facilitate as many FAFSA fill outs as possible. Fill outs is an actual word, I think. Um, but we're going to make sure that we uh, keep doing what we're doing to bring you those voices. And we've got two important voices, one returning voice, and you'll know her when you hear her. But I'm going to start with the new voice first. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get him on a microphone. He is Dr. Timothy Knowles. He is the president of the Carnegie, Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Tim, what's going on? Joe, thank you very much for having me. Surely it's great to be here with you. Now, it's see, you're not supposed to, to reveal surely early before because now you've interrupted her applause i didn't even get the crowd amped up for her tim you know but that's all right we're gonna give you a mulligan on that one it, it could be any shirley it's it, it isn't yeah, that's true it could be any shirley just not the one it could be but it is the one that we think it is and let, let's bring her in right now ladies and gentlemen her name. There's the applause. Settle down, everybody. Dr. Shirley Collado. She is president and CEO of College Track. Shirley, welcome back. All right. It's great to be back, Joe. Thanks for having me. And I'm thrilled to be alongside my freedom fighter friend, Timothy Knowles. It sounds like you guys have a very um, far away relationship from each other that you just, right? No, this isn't a close relationship at all between the two of you. Um, I've, I'm excited to have this episode because I feel like you're going to give each other a hard time at times, which is always a little bit of fun. Um, Tim, why don't you um, lay the foundation for us? And I want to talk about the CPC. And we've got some people going, what is that? And I'm going to say, you got to wait for it. But we're going to start first by saying, what is the Carnegie Foundation? Um, tell us about the uh, teaching a piece of this, what you oversee. Level set for us. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Um, so Carnegie Foundation was established by Andrew Carnegie in 1906. It is actually the first not-for-profit organization in the United States. True. It is the place that brought... Um, the world TIA CREF, the, the, the retirement fund for a vast majority of teachers and professors across the nation and others in the social sector. We helped to establish standards for engineering, law, medicine, and education schools. We created the Pell Grants. We created the Carnegie classifications, which are the R1 institutions are the ones that are most well known uh, research one institutions. We also brought the world something called the Carnegie Unit, which is otherwise known as the credit hour uh, or the course credit. So the, the bedrock currency of the educational economy. Um, th so our history is long. We've had a significant impact on both K-12 and post-secondary education across the nation over those 120 years. I'm, I'm the 10th president in 120 years, which gives me about a decade to do something useful. 
we have put our stake firmly in the ground um, in terms of advancing social and economic mobility for young people um, across the nation. So particularly first generation, low income, and young people from underrepresented communities um, to ensure that uh, they can lead purposeful lives. And, and that's why Shirley and I are, are joined at the hip because it's a mission we share. Amazing. Uh, what has the Carnegie Foundation not done? Should have been where I asked my question. But uh, thanks for laying that out for us. Tim sounds like it's a, been a few things. Well, let me let me ask you before I pass it to Shirley. What when you come into this role as president? What's your focus? What are you looking to achieve legacy wise? Um, that's a great question, Joe. I, one of the the amazing things about the Carnegie Foundation, in my view, and w one of the magnetic forces for me is that it pivots. It, 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 it is like a, an incubator for big, important ideas over the course of its history. And so a president is hired. They're given space to think with the team, with the trustees, with educators across the country. What are the most important levers that we could push today that would would transform both K-12 and post-secondary education um, for the decade or decades ahead. And so we are, um, as I said, decidedly focused on, on helping ensure that the post-secondary sector in particular becomes a much more vital engine for um, economic and social mobility. It's not to suggest it isn't an important engine. It is, but we think it could be a much, much stronger one. Um, and on the, on the K-12 front, we're, we're taking a, a very assertive run at the Carnegie unit, which is in essence, the conflation of time and learning. So the, the, the course credit, um, well, just by way of example, in 1906, the Carnegie Foundation announced that a college degree, a four-year college degree should be 120 credits. Today, it's 120 credits. We've, yes. learned, we've learned an enormous amount about, about how people learn since 1906 from neuroscientists, cognitive psychologists, learning psych learning scientists. And, and we know that, that, that learning doesn't just happen in 45 minute increments. Um, learning happens everywhere. Learning happens at vastly variable rates, depending on the individual and the subject of study. It happens with peers. It happens in informal and formal settings. It happens by solving real problems through experiential education. And yet we've built a system where that doesn't happen nearly enough. Um, so in the in the K-12 space, we're, we're interested in bringing, um, for, for lack of a better term, um, competency-based, legitimately authentic competency-based learning um, from the from the margins, which it's where it's always existed um, since Dewey and Montessori, it's existed um, into the mainstream and making um, competency based, not time based systems, um, the 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 future of K twelve, which are which are which are more engaging, more experiential, um, more equitable, and more effective. Epic. Uh, music to my ears when I hear you talk about that as a current higher ed administrator. Surely, I know this probably was music to your ears too. Hearing, you know, because sometimes you, the Carnegie Foundation, you know, who who is that? Where where are these people? The Carnegie Foundation. What are they doing? How do they think? Um, that was really good insight. And surely, you're at college track now. Previous um, college president did did the job, as it were, right? This yeah. hard work. How are you today? And tell us about College Track. I'm I'm great, um, Joe. Even in these interesting times in education, and as you just heard from Tim, you know I'm in great company here because we're not only talking about really focusing on what's best for students, and especially students that are constantly underestimated and left behind, um, but really what we need to do fundamentally to shift systems. And so I have the great benefit after serving in public and private higher education. And yes, most recently as president of Ithaca College um, in my home state of New York, uh, have the incredible opportunity um, uh, uh, a bit over two years now at the helm of college track, which we like to say that we are the most comprehensive college completion program and movement in the country. 
essentially what we do, which is really distinct, is we dedicate 10 years to students and their families locally rooted deeply in community in the neighborhoods that they come from. The vast majority of our students are first in their family to go to college. The vast majority of our students are full Pell grant eligible, um, so the highest need. And we have students from all walks of life that, demo that really um, reflect the demographics of the neighborhoods that they come from. And now soon to be 13 communities around the country, neighborhoods around the country, with Baltimore being the uh, latest addition, we deliberately go into neighborhoods that are not overly saturated with college completion resources, where post-secondary credentials are uh, lower than we ever want them to be. Um, and we essentially, if you kind of think about, Joe, all the bells and whistles and the privileges that people with wealth and resources and legacies of education get to have in their house households, you know, the college advising, the, te the test prep, the, the, the uh, um, advantages to advanced placement courses and college courses, um, to, to technology, to, um, uh, to a motivational and affirming environment. And yes, a college counselor that doesn't have a caseload that includes hundreds and hundreds of students. Um, we essentially have socially engineered that at College Track on the um, premise that we will support students all the way through high school, into college and through college, through our College Thrive program, to the completion of a bachelor's degree. And then, as Tim pointed out, going out into the world with low debt, <laughs> social mobility, and living a really purposeful life, having agency. So that's what we're doing. And I get to work across the ecosystem of higher ed, K-12 and career with students that are incredible and are in every classroom in this country, but are constantly um, swimming in systems that don't work for them. Tell them like it is. We're gonna, I, I wanna just uh, talk about your website for a second. And then we'll kind of open it up to, to both you guys and bring you both in together. The College Track website, collegetrack.org, awesome. The, you, right when you get to the site, it says, we can't wait for the future. Yeah. That, I, I just I read that earlier today, and I was like, wow. Thinking about artificial intelligence, thinking about education, thinking about being left behind. We can't wait for the future. We have to double down on bringing education. Talk about what that means to you a little bit. We can't wait for the future. Is that a mantra? Is it a motto? Is it a, a, a MO? Talk about it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, thank you for the shout out on the website and, uh, and, and the truth about, you know, while we've been, well, everybody uh, in this country has been like clutching their pearls worried about the demographics of our country shifting, the enrollment cliff, all the things that college presidents worry about on a daily basis, guess what? There are places and people, organizations and institutions that have been teaching the future for a long time. 100%. <laughs> and they've, been, they've, they've been doing that with very little resources um, and often not the ones that get the limelight um, and so the, the we can't wait for the future is about the sense of urgency that we feel right now um, when we think about the workforce that we need in this country and what it really means with all of these existential things that are shifting and how we think about um, education. And the future for us, the answers, the solutions, they actually come from the people who are most deeply impacted by the issues. They're the experts. They know what's wrong with the system. It's, there's nothing wrong with them. <laughs> it's it's really that the systems haven't been working for them. So that's really what it about uh, what we're about, and also this idea of what it truly means to democratize potential. Mm. So imagine if you give a kid not just opportunity, but as we say at College Track, we want opportunity, but we also want choice, purpose, and power. And when young people get to be good consumers of their education with their families, and then we affirm that. Uh, in the systems that they're in, like the, I mean, it's just endless. The possibilities are endless. So you can't democratize potential without giving people opportunity, choice, purpose, and power. And that's what Carnegie is absolutely invested in and certainly what the commission um, is about. And sorry, that's another secret. I'm not supposed to give away the, the CPC. You'll hear about it. Opportunity, choice, purpose, and power. 
Okay. That's a fact. That's a fact. I love it. Um, I, I love that as the, the headline for this episode as we talk about what, you know, what the future looks like. You're talking about vision. You're talking about what, how do we look at education in the future? And I think this is where the CPC comes in as we talk about visionary thinking. Tim, over to you. What is the CPC? And why was it created? And how is Shirley involved? Because, I mean, great work getting Shirley involved, by the way. Um, how, how did this all come together? So the Carnegie Post-Secondary Commission is what those letters actually stand for. Um, and this was an um, endeavor that when I got to Carnegie, I knew I wanted to bring together some of the the leading actors and and practitioners and thinkers in terms of not just post-secondary, but K-12 and post-secondary. And so the first person I turned to was um, was a person who understood choice and power and agency and opportunity. And that was Shirley. And I said, Shirley, we need to we need to pull together the best minds in literally in the at the end of the last century, at the end of the 18 in the 1800s, there was a committee of 10. And this committee of 10 basically crafted the public school system that we have and it has it has held it, it in large measure because of the carnegie unit and and the the institutionalization of time equals learning but it was a group of 10 people who at that time were all white and all men um i turned to shirley because i knew shirley knew a lot of people and i knew shirley brought a vision for for learning and 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 what the future architecture of of education should look like k-12 and post-secondary and together we invited a group of uh, 15 of our 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 colleagues friends conspirators from across the country to think about what are the most important levers that we can press as a nation to significantly um, improve outcomes for 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 young people with the premise being um, if I was to, to summarize Shirley's uh, comments even and put them even in pithier form, it would be talent is ubiquitous. We know that. And opportunity is not. And so how, how do we make both K-12 and post-secondary institutions much, much more vibrant and vital engines for, um, for creating opportunity? For the talent that that is just rife and and rich in in our nation and the world, and so we have been working together for a year. Um, we're working on a whole bunch of different vectors. Um, we're interested in new models of um, post secondary education in particular that are more affordable, uh, more engaging, more experiential, more aligned, um, both aligned to K twelve and aligned to the workforce. So really building coherent pathways, as Shirley was talking about, um, where um, the Carnegie Foundation is going to, with with a, uh, one of our partners who's also represented on the commission, the American Council on Education, is um, working together to reclassify every higher ed institution in the country. Um, right. And I know they're paying attention because I will get on the phone with 1,500 college presidents at a time. And and they are paying attention to what this reclassification means. One of the things we're looking at is rethinking what what does it mean to be a research one institution. Really, historically, that's been defined by how many dollars you have, and and how many resources you have, how many PhD programs, how many PhD students, how many research projects you have underway. Um, and then the federal government comes along and says, if you're an R1 institution, you're eligible for hundreds of millions of dollars of research dollars. And so it's a self-fulfilling pot sort of machine that we've built that R1s stay R1s. It can be very, very difficult for, for those that aren't in the R1 um, machine to, to become one. Um, this is lunacy. So we're looking at that. But probably more important on the classifications front, we're also going to introduce in, a, in about 10 to 12 months a new classification that will look at the value institutions are adding in terms of contributions to social and economic mobility. 
the aim isn't this isn't a ranking. So this isn't trying to distinguish between the 80th and the 81st institution. This is about grouping institutions like institutions and then saying which of those like institutions are actually driving social and economic mobility most effectively. The, then the aim is to learn so that we can actually get better at this as a society. Um, and and I expect, just as been the case with the, the, the R1s traditionally, to drive state and, and federal um, tranches of public capital to those places that are actually moving the needle. Um, this is a really important piece of our overall architecture if we're committed to, to, um, to a nation that, that is, is um, actually aspiring to the American dream, where making this the place where you can you can actually prevail no matter who you are, no matter where you came from, um, no matter what your background, your zip code. Uh, so so the the Carnegie Post-Secondary Commission is is working on on um, th those and other vectors um, you know with with I, I think the final thing I'll say and then I want to hear what Shirley says about it. Um, uh, we Shirley and Cuyado and Tawanda Jordan, um, who's the president of St. Mary's, are the co-chairs. Um, but one of the things I love about it is that it's made up of a disproportionate number of first generation institutional leaders itself. So the lenses that are being brought to bear are are lenses of extraordinary possibility. Of, of knowledge of what both K-12 and post-secondary, when done right, can bring um, to young people. Um, and that's that's sort of living and breathing and woven throughout the 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 the, the fabric of the commission um, and and a and a frankly a, a, a gorgeous counterpoint to the committee of 10, um, which now is 140 or 130 years old. Um, Shirley, what what would you say about the post secondary commission? No, I think I think you uh, really summarized it so beautifully, Tim. I mean, the the most meaningful thing for me is the assortment of leaders that are in this space, um, and to have Tawanda and I leading it and shining a bright light on institutions and people um, who really embody in so many ways. Um, the important things we need to be paying attention to for the future of education in this country is really exciting. I think, Joe, the other thing that's important to note is the intersection of leaders that are um, in K-12, in higher ed, in career, um, uh, in some of the systems, big public systems or organizations like the American Council on Education. These are not people who usually interact in, in the work together. They're at, it's actually one of the fundamental issues that we have is we don't have these integrated pathways or sectors that actually work for kids and their families. So the commission in so many ways, what we're focusing on, who the players are, how we work together and what we actually embrace as adding value in the conversation and the work is 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 kind of just it, it's not kind of it's actually counter to what we typically see when people are getting together and gathering and talking about big big educational issues and it is people and systems and it's the integration of those things coming together to really focus on social mobility and pulling the most significant levers that can work for the future students um, and dismantle, rearrange, reimagine systems that haven't actually been working. Those us. are those are th some consider those dangerous words, Shirley. Rearrange, reimagine, re-engineer. Ooh, you did. Yeah, you're saying change, healthy, aren't you? I mean, it's healthy yeah. disruption. And so, you know, it's I mean, about it, time. It's about time. Did you know that Genzibar has helped more than 1,400 campuses worldwide transform and drive institutional and student success? If you want to learn more about Genzibar or get a more in-depth look at what's happening, join us at Genzibar Jam in Dallas, Texas at the Gaylord Texan, May 29th through June 1st. Let's jam. It, I mean, and Joe, you know this and your listeners know this, but the 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 value proposition of the post-secondary sector is being questioned. 
mm-hmm. there are people who are saying is it worth it and 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 at least um as the post pandemic evidence would suggest they are saying uh, uh, new sectors of our of our nation are saying no perhaps it's not Yikes! and voting with their their th- that combined with a a 900 year old business model that may have outlived its useful shelf life that or at least needs to be challenged um combined with demogra- fundamental demographic shift in our nation where fewer students are coming into post secondary all create a very legitimate set of questions about what happens next there are some on the on the one end of the continuum that says oh post secondary doesn't matter anymore it's it's it it it's it's no longer valuable businesses will train us there's another there's another path um we're not of that view however we are of the view that we do need new models we actually do whether they're inside out models institutions that are growing the models or or their their models from the outside in as it were so on the commission is a guy aaron ramison who's was the founder of masterclass and then went on to found a, a community college called outlier um who's who's the outside is really outside in you also have uh, an astrid tuminez who is the president of utah valley university who under her leadership she grew up in living literally in a house made out of sticks in the Philippines. Um, and and she, at, as president of Utah Valley University, has um, is educating the most diverse school in Utah of about serving about 40,000 students. She has 12,000 high school students enrolled in dual credit and dual enrollment programming. Um, so she's thinking about education not as a I'm president of a of a, a a local regional university. She's she's thinking about it as I'm president of an institution that is focused as much on K twelve as post secondary as work. Uh, so so I put that on the table because I think we're trying to be as clear eyed as we can about the reality of 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 American higher education, and instead of saying of waving a white flag um saying we think there are ways that we can get much smarter to make it much more affordable much more engaging much more career aligned um and and equally or more rigorous the, uh, while creating institutions where young people actually feel they belong you know i want to go back to the cpc just for a second because i want you to know i did get the invitation to join but it you didn't tell me it was that came with invisible it was like invisible ink or something so my kid grabbed my leg i turned to the side and then it didn't you know there was like steps in there and then i lost it and so that's why i didn't get back to you um but i, I just want you to know that i got it um because you were talking about the most yeah, visionary minds in higher ed so i mean obviously I'm we got a telegram from you i think it was your child to say don't oh don't yeah, that's that's probably true, in fact. Um, but you know what's funny about everything that you said, Tim, and I'm going to ask you this question, Shirley, as a former college president. Um, in higher ed, when we talk about change and we talk about time and seat and we talk about the Carnegie unit, the name Carnegie gets thrown around as if as if there's this. I don't know, secret order of the Masons uh, that, you know, every time you speak change in higher education, the Carnegie Foundation president comes out and says, Execute order 66. So that you so that you can't change. Right. Um, And and it's embedded in higher ed. And we do this with accreditation, too. Like, oh, accreditation. Shirley, I know you you want to do this new program, but accreditation. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Carnegie. And to hear Tim come out and say, first gen students, new models, the Carnegie unit is way old. Like, let's start thinking about other ways. This is dispelling the mythical creature around preventative change in higher ed. What, as a college president and now in college track, you, you remember what those people saying those types of things, how refreshing is it to be part of this change at this level? Well, you know, um, 
I, I want to go back to what Tim said in that we really feel, even with all the disruption and the questioning around the value, uh, especially of a bachelor's degree, of being liberally educated about systems that aren't affordable, that aren't really integrated with K-12 and, you know, what students are doing when they graduate and how much debt they have. I mean, so much. And, you know, and and, and the debates, and you mentioned FAFSA earlier, um, and we know that our, our campuses are on fire right now with so many issues. It's odd to say but all of this movement for me is a reflection of how hopeful we still feel, how deep our conviction is, that it really is about reimagining something that can evolve and should evolve to serve students, especially students that are coming from communities without a legacy of education and um, the financial resources to do whatever they want, or even just the, the network to make a call and get the job and get the internship or be able to study abroad and have you know meaningful summer experiences. And so um, it's very refreshing. Uh, I do have to say too, if you look at the commissioners and, and Tim's um, career and our own journey in terms of the work, you know, these are trailblazers that have been in it for the long haul they have been doing work for a significant amount of time. And this kind of change takes that kind of long-term, we're in it for the long haul, and we have to keep students at the center of what we're doing and deciding. So yes, it's refreshing. You know, I think you know this, Joe, when we talked and I was at Ithaca College, I mean, I, I wasn't on that path to be a president. What this is about is from what positions and, and areas can we actually have a stake in the work and 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 make change happen? And so um, I've never been in this work to be a wallflower. Uh, I think Tim knows that really well. Um, but you can do that within systems, outside of a system, adjacent to a system, across the system. And that's what I think the commission is actually really reflecting. And what Tim is mobilizing at Carnegie, one is, you know, kudos to Carnegie for looking in the mirror and saying, we're willing to actually look at our history and evolve. And we could do that while still honoring the core essence and mission of this great organization. I think colleges and universities have the ability to do that. Workforce has the ability to do that. K-12 has the, but none of us can do it alone. It has to be like this call to action that we're all really doing together. And that's the part that, you know, we really want to drill into and do. And we've highlighted in the commission some very specific areas where there is movement. And if we get rally together and push it, we actually can act, can put a stake in the ground and move, move the needle on, on several things while there's this kind of, you know, catastrophic narrative going around that this thing is a mess and it's not going to go anywhere. I, I resist that. I, I, you know, we're the ones we've been waiting for, like, let's go for it. And we can do that in good company. And yeah, disagree. It's fine. That's what we should be doing. Right. Um, That's the point so of being educated. This is totally. right. I, you know, Tim, Tim, back to you just because I, I want to just re-ask it and give you a chance to respond. You know, there's a there's a narrative out there that Carnegie has some interest in keeping everything the same. Got to keep the credit hour the same. Uh, it, it's in our best interest to keep R1 institutions as R1 institutions and make sure that there is little to no disruption. And then you go, OK, well, if there's no students coming to higher ed because everybody's questioning the value, then it's not going to really matter what your classification is. We're seeing closures. We're seeing enrollment declines. Carnegie's interest is in evolution. Isn't it? Carnegie's interest is is today is in transformation, not evolution. In a in a in a, in a that's what I graduate. meant to say, Tim. I meant to say transportation. Just so you know. I mean, in, in 1906, the 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 Carnegie unit was a brilliant idea. It was an inc a totally unstandardized, non-standardized system that we lived in, and we couldn't tell the difference between Boston Latin School and a and a and a little one-room schoolhouse on the western frontier. We didn't know what was happening. It was really happening in each individual classroom across the country. We're at a similar moment, uh, I think, of transformation, not just driven by by um, by by technology and AI, and and not just driven by the economy shifting in the ways that it's shifting, 
but driven by kind of a recognition, like a, a, a demand. There's there's a there's a legitimate demand for a transformed system, and I think we underestimate that at our peril. Like we, one of the things we did in the last eight twelve months was we looked at every. Um, portrait of a graduate, which has been developed by stakeholder groups in in across the country, in, in schools, in systems, and states. So these are these are reflections of what teachers, parents, professors, civic leaders want for for graduates, whether of high school, typically from high school, uh, sometimes from beyond high school. And they had an incredible amount in common. Uh, there were there were eleven core skills and dispositions that show up rural, urban, red, blue, purple, regardless of race, class, that that are are very consistent. There's there's so I I would argue that there's a there's an invisible American consensus about the core purposes of schooling that exists. So it's our job to to Shirley's point about not waiting for the future. It's our job to help elevate, amplify that and and build build the opportunity, build the build the architecture that would enable that consensus to come to be. That's that's the job of educators in and 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 the whether I'm in in Utah or Rhode Island or or Indiana or Illinois or Texas or New Mexico it's really consistent what people want for their young people. And it's and and maybe the most important thing from my perspective, because I, I came out of the University of Chicago, I love evidence, I love data, that the things that Americans are saying they want from their K-12 and post-secondary institutions are the things that predict success. They're, they are empirically predictive of 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 educational attainment, of longer lifespan, of healthier lives, of civic engagement, of of, of volunteering and giving blood and voting, they they so so the things that we are after as a country are the right things. What 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 stands in the way is a lot of noise sometimes and a lot of polarization a lot of the time. But but we think we can cut through that. We think there's an opportunity. So so Carnegie is not standing on a. Uh, in defense of a of of a system that hasn't proved to be transformative, we're 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 interested in 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 pushing past that, um, and 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 we also know we can't do it alone. We have to do it in partnership, which is why we're partnered with College Track. It's why we're partnered with a university on the continent of Africa. It's why we're partnered with extraordinary state leaders and system leaders. Um, and 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 civic leaders across the nation because we know we're we're um, this is a big complicated problem. A Americans, whether it's higher ed or K twelve, we we believe in democratic localism. We we don't like a one size fits all solution, and nor should we. Um, so the only way you you make for transformation in that context is if you do it um, really locking arms. And, and in partnership with with organizations um, that might be viewed sometimes as unusual bedfellows. I want to find out a little bit more about you two uh, just for a second. We're going to do a little a little fun game here, if you will. In fact, uh, Tim, you have a uh, a colleague named Keto. You know who I'm talking about, and she said, "Do that, do that to those guys." So I I said, "Yeah, I'll do it." Um, let's see here. Do you guys hear this? You hear this thinking music? Okay. Yeah, nice. Okay. It, it should be helping you think. I'm going to ask you either or. This is another in episode episode, if you will, of the Edup either or experience. This is where Shirley and Tim. I'm going to give you a phrase, uh, two two phrases, higher ed words, things, and you're going to tell me which one you like better. Um, if you choose both, you do owe me money, five dollars. If you can't decide, um, and I'll be reaching out to Keto to collect, and we'll warm you up. And Tim, we're going to go with you first. Tim, sitting desk or standing desk? Standing. Shirley, sitting or standing desk? Standing. Okay, you can free, free feel free to elaborate on any of these if you want to. Um, let's go. We'll go to higher ed one. Uh, Shirley, over to you. Unlearn or relearn? Unlearn. Tim, unlearn or relearn? No desk. <laughs> Five dollars. Um, we're gonna 
<laughs> well, well, okay, we'll have a l another fun one. Um, Tim, over to you. Dot the I's and cross the T's, or the devil is in the details. Devil is definitely in those details. Shirley? Amen. Amen. Yes. Okay. All right. We'll go a little bit. We'll go. Shirley, over to you. This will be a fun one for you. Student first or meet students where they are. Love it. Students first. Tim? I think that's the same. I don't think that's an either or. I'm not going with either. I think they are the same. Oh, God. <laughs> Tim, you're my favorite so far because I keep getting richer. Um, he's so okay. funny. He's such a rebel. I know. And I'm feeling uh, my pockets are getting fatter every time he talks. All right, here we go. Uh, Tim, over to you. Power skills or durable skills? Skills. Essential skills. Okay. Shirley, don't be like Tim and keep owing me money. Power <laughs> skills or durable skills? I think, po look, first-gen students have superpowers all the way. So they already have that. I'm going to say durable skills. Okay. Shirley, we'll do this one. You. This is going to be a fun one, fun one again. S the student's a consumer or the student's something else? The student's something else. Tim? The student's what the student wants okay. to be. Okay. Tim? So Interesting. In a affordability time, that's one of my favorite questions, right? Uh, Tim, early morning meeting or late afternoon meeting? Late afternoon meeting with, with like espresso or wine. Either way, yeah, that, those additives don't char don't cost you money. I agree with those, Shirley. Early morning meeting with a latte, or we're walking while we're talking early in the morning. Like it, I like it. Okay, couple more. Um, Shirley, collaboration or competition? Collaboration all the way. It's harder. It's more rewarding. Tim, I grew up with brothers, so I'll go. Okay, so we know which one. We know which one you're going to pick. Okay, this is this will be the last one we do, Tim, to you. Culture or strategy? Uh, strategy. Surely. I'd have to go for strategy for sure. Okay, one more, one more. I'll do one more. Surely, this will be the last one. But one also one of my favorites. Council or committee? Oof. Give me the Both five bucks. Both, you know, we're a commission. You see what I mean? We're a commission, right? <laughs> I, you know, the, the the issue of death by committee in higher ed is real. It is. So if I'm forced to choose and because I'm not going to give you five bucks, I'll go with council. Fair enough. Council or committee, Tim, last one. I am not sitting on anyone's committee. Well, hopefully you guys uh, all learned a little bit more about Shirley and Tim as we do the Yet Up Either Or experience, which I probably find more fun than my guests do. Uh, but, uh, you know, I do so many of these podcasts, I got to have a little fun too. Um, but I want to come back around to our two final questions that we want to ask you both, Shirley and Tim. Um, Shirley, I'll, I'll start with you. What else do you want to say about college track? Anything you want to say, anything we didn't get to, anything of importance, I, I want to give you the open mic. So tell us what we need to hear. Oh, gosh, thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Um, I think two things that I would say is, one, we are relentlessly optimistic, and it's really important that we focus on the gems and the gifts that young people across this country have, and just be unapologetic about that and not see them as the problem. That's one, just kind of culturally speaking, it's just so important as we think about the answers to these complicated issues. And the other just really fun thing, Joe, if you see us in the news about a week ago, we just announced an amazing, incredible cross-sector partnership with the Baltimore Ravens. Amazing. <laughs> you said it. MNT M &T Bank and College Track coming together with Baltimore City Schools. And we will have our first ever Baltimore Ravens College Track Center in the great charm city of Baltimore. But what's most incredible about that partnership, it's about everything we talked about today. It's the integrated pathways. It is an NFL team, okay, coming together with a bank and a city school system and a nonprofit and saying, we're collectively going to address this issue and we want to build integrated paths in K-12, college and career and do it in a city that's so important for the future of American education. 
Um, that investment is huge. So stay tuned. We'd love to come back and talk with you about what's happening in the great city of Baltimore. And it's actually something that the commission is going to be looking at because it's such a great example of the things that we talked about today. So thanks for letting me plug that in. Victory. That's a victory. And yeah, it's, uh, since you said it, we'll invite you back to talk about it when you're ready. How about that? Whenever you're ready to come back. Well, right. I'll have new sounds for you. Tim, same question to you. What else do, should we know about the Carnegie Foundation? Anything you want to say? Anything you want to talk about? Open mic. I would just say if if your listeners are interested in the, in, in the transformation of the American high school or, or catalyzing post-secondary so that it becomes a more powerful engine for social and economic mobility um, that I, I genuinely meant it when I said we believe in doing this in partnership and that we welcome um, your inquiries, your questions, reaching out, um, exploration of of ways that we can work with you. So so to please do that. Final question to you both, um, and you could take it however you want, take it together one at a time. What do you see for the future of higher education? It's a, a, a moment, and I define moment in a, probably a, a this the the shape of a decade, but we are in a moment of incredible transformation. There's going to be pain in that transformation and and lots of change, um, but there's enormous amounts of opportunity to think about how um, what is what is really perhaps the most important engine for our nation and for the world historically. Um, there, there's an opportunity to make it fit this century um, and 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 really actually do do justice to to um, to the young people who are who are coming its way. Uh, so it's it's yes, it's going to be uncomfortable. Yes, it's going to be painful. Yes, we're going to see change um, and we're going to see um, a, a lot of opportunity for for evolution, transformation, growth and, and serving young people um, more effectively. The undisputed champion of the world is change. A billion and oh, never, never lost. Shirley, same, same, uh, same question to you. What do you see for the future of higher ed? You know, I couldn't have said it better than Tim. I think when we situate the context of where we're in, if you think about it, Joe, like we just went through a global pandemic. Um, the democracy in our country is the most in the most vulnerable state that I that I've seen in my lifetime. Um, when we think about the unapologetic nature of the climate crisis, um, what's happening just globally <laughs> around people's ability to actually negotiate um, and support one another across lines of difference. Like these are huge, massive things that have created this sea change that we're currently in. And so my thing around this is I say to my colleagues in all sectors of business is, do we need anything else to happen to prove that something really has to shift? Right. I mean, think about the most historical things that the you know that we've been able to witness, the three of us in our lifetime. And so I just think like I don't need any more proof that this is the most urgent moment. And as Tim said, the most hopeful because we there's no path that we can take but a path forward that looks quite different than what we've been used to before. It just doesn't work anymore. So um, I'm hopeful, even with all of that, but I just wanted to kind of contextualize, like, think about just take stock and audit of what's happening just in the last decade. So now it's time to move. And we can only do that with shared humanity and community. And I'm- you left out one thing that yeah. further dominant, it's further, further, um, puts a fine point on the humanity piece, and that's this. Artificial intelligence. Something oh, you didn't okay. mention. Well, Hold that's another conversation. Changes. Yeah. Hold another conversation, but it's embedded in actually the work that, that we're doing for sure. So, yes, yes. Lots has happened. Um, but a lot happened on this episode. Um, we had a great conversation. 
I learned many things. Um, I, I think what I'm most excited to hear is about synergy between forward thinking leaders that have the means to create change. And so it's been an honor to talk to both of you. I'm really inspired to hear about the Carnegie Foundation and the way you're looking at the future of higher education. We hope you guys had fun today, especially on the Ed Up Either Or experience, which now we know some of your preferences. So who's sitting, who's standing, uh, you know, who owes me money and who doesn't in Tim's case. Um, so uh, here we go. Let's get him out of here. Ladies and gentlemen, first, she is the president and CEO of College Track. She is Dr. Shirley Collado. Shirley, what an honor to have you back uh, for the second time. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Joe. You've been a gracious host. Thank you so much. And I'll pay you for saying that um, later. And of course, our second guest, he is Dr. Timothy Knowles. He is president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Tim, we thought I thought that you know, you left me for a second because you, you know, the ed up either or experience got you, but in the end, you came back, and that means a lot. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Well, we hope you guys had fun. Thank there you, you had it, everybody. You've just ed upped. What's up, everybody? It's time to jam, jam, jam. At Genza Bar's annual meeting at the Gaylord Texan in Dallas, Texas, May 29th through June 1st. Learn, share, and connect. The conference offers a wide range of learning opportunities for all Genzabar users. You can share your experiences to help others increase enrollment, improve retention, and meet advancement goals, and connect. Find out how your colleagues are using their Genzabar systems, hear what's coming from Genzabar, and learn new strategies that can help your institution. Remember, it's time to jam, jam, jam. Genzabar's annual meeting.